Hey, it's Karina Reichman, and you are listening to Comes a Time with O'Teal Burbridge and Mike Fenoya. If you're digging the podcast, do these guys a favor and review and subscribe. It means a lot. Be sure to follow the pod on social media, YouTube, and if you're joining for bonus episodes and exclusive content, go to patreon.com forward slash comes a time pod and get on the bus. And now, here's Mike and O'Teal. I'd like to just acknowledge one thing here real quick, guys, is um, Coach Pacinger taught me to not be a victim. Right. So for a long time, I wasn't vulnerable. Because to me, vulnerability and victimhood was the same thing. Uh, I've learned from I've learned from Marie O'Teal, who, you know, I'll connect you with, that vulnerability is strength. But if it's if you're too vulnerable, then you're a victim. Right. So there's a balance. I've learned that balance. You guys have done an amazing job of vulnerability on the show. Thank you. Which allows other people to go, oh, I have that too. Or like, I need, like, and there are times with you and your guests, I can't tell you many times, guys, like, we might need to do another podcast of just the serendipity of your show in my life and and hearing the right thing at the right time from one of you guys or the right guest that really led me to what I needed at that moment. And like, I'd almost as an invite to the community of people out there that watch you guys just say, you know, if you watch this with some intention, there's some really magical stuff in here with these guests that are on and as vulnerable and curious as you guys are and looking at it from these two different, you know, sort of filters or frames, whatever you want to call it. um, There's so much magic in this content. It's, it's um so i again i just want Tell to thank people you guys a little for bit how because yeah. you have i really appreciate that i think that, you man. started you. playing music right more joined a band did yeah, you say yeah. that kind of came out of the podcast yeah can you well, talk about way, that a little? I, I will just you you got to remind me to, to tell the stamet story too because i'm i'm now an investor in paul stamets's business well, and, tell and, that and, one tell that one first okay. that's cool we got time okay. well first off dude <laughs> thank you before you do i just want yeah. to acknowledge what you're saying and yeah thank you, thank you very very much i mean yeah, it means man. a lot and and just yes. knowing that it makes a difference yeah makes it no, more, I have no re- yeah absolutely thank you. And thank, I you. thank you guys for it you, you, you probably heart you know like anyways i thank you guys for it so so the stamets story so I have a I have one of my Navy SEAL friends. I I called him and asked him if I could share his name on this. So he's given me permission to. But I have a friend, Sweet. John Devine, who is one of the sweetest humans I've ever met. He at like eight years old said he was going to be a Navy SEAL. Wow. So, <clears throat> and his friend Dom Rosso, um, Mike, you'll get a kick out of this. Dom's the only guy that's like SEAL Team Six and has mm-hmm. two Super Bowl rings. He coached <laughs> wow. he coached the New England Patriots while he was a SEAL. Wow. And he's on the sideline for the Super Bowls and he he's unbelievable. But so anyways, John grows up with Dom and and they both go on having incredible seal, seal careers. John was one of the guys who really understood training dogs, so he's a dog trainer. And um, uh, he in COVID he was married to a woman who well, I think she was number 2 on America's ta- talent for dogs. So they're like the Brad and Angelina the dog world. Like he's the seal <laughs> dog trainer and she's she's this like famous dog trainer. And they get a divorce during during um, during the pandemic. And she goes in her bus, like her, her VW, travels the country and writes a blog post like daily about what a bad guy he is, which is not true. Like I will tell you, John is one of the sweetest humans you've ever met in your life. But I, you know, and, he, and I know he has some PTSD from all the war he's, you know, he, wars he's been in. And with this, I, as a friend, I'm ashamed to admit this, I was putting off calling him. I was not in a state mentally yeah. where I was able, I knew what was coming. I knew the phone call I was about to have with my friend and I wasn't prepared for it. I didn't have the courage to call him for about two weeks. Hmm. And finally, one day I'm driving, I go, you got to call him. So I call him up and he's like, Hey bro, what's going on? And we just have a, we have a good old, like a good old yeah. pre-war, you know, I, I actually didn't know John pre-war, but like a lot of these guys pre-war are different than post-war. Right. So just, you know, yeah. And so 30 minutes in the call, I go, Hey dude, I got to talk to you, man. I got to tell you, I was afraid of this call. Like what, 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 you know, you sound like you're in a great place. He's like, I am. He goes, you know, there's this guy, Marcus Capone, who's a legendary seal. And 
Marcus saw my situation and he sent me to Mexico and I did this thing called Abogate. Yeah. And he goes, and he goes, and listen, man, I, I saw six of my demons. I had a conversation with him and, and I'm like, and, and he's like, and I'm good. And I really am good. And he goes, and it takes follow-up treatment, but I'm, I'm on the road. And he is to this day, man, he is this one of the sweetest guys. He would be amazing wow. for the podcast. He was just, he's an amazing human being. So of course, I hang up with him. I get home to go for a jog, and you guys are interviewing Paul Snellman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it sent me down. Yeah. So it sent me down the rabbit hole. Let me fast forward a bit. So it sends me. Down, I I read everything. I read Michael Pollan. I read everything. I read every um, study I could. Everything. I'm obsessive like that. So I get a call from a guy named Chris Kantowitz, who I hadn't talked to in like 17 years. When I first got money in my life in the NFL, Chris was starting this business that I invested $25,000 in, right? And that business went away, but Chris calls me out of the blue. I go, hey man, what's going on? He's like, hey, I'm in LA. I just thought I'd look you up. I go, great. So we chat. I go, what are you doing for work now? He goes, well, you know, I met this guy named Paul Stamets and I'm running his business now. And as a matter of fact, I've moved to some island like in Canada yeah. And we live right next to each other. Cortez and Island, business. yeah. Cor yeah. And he's like, you should come hang. You should come hang. Oh, it's the beautiful. Yeah. So so long story short, I look at their <laughs> business. I really study the business. And I invest in Paul's business, Michael Medica. <laughs> and so I'm just thinking like how, like, so, you know. Yeah, full circle. How hey. mystical, how full circle all this stuff is. But here's the story. And this has been substantiated by Chris's friends. So Chris is trying to get into psychedelics and thinking about psychedelics. He's a, he's a serial entrepreneur. He's a very successful entrepreneur. And he was, and so he was going to Burning Man. And one of his friends says, Hey, I've got a, a buddy named Paul Stamets. You should meet him there. And Chris just sort of said, sure. So Chris says that there's a dust storm and out, he's like, you couldn't see this far in front of your face. And out of the blue, I see this like bearded guy with these big goggles. He walks right up to me and he says, Somebody told me that we're supposed to meet. And it <laughs> it's was like Star Wars. Or and, it, and it was, yeah, and it was Stamets. So that's how they, and, and two weeks later, Chris sold everything and moved to that island and the rest of his business. <laughs> wow, man. Isn't that amazing? I mean, see, it's the timing, yeah. man. That is yeah. what gets me. I'm like, yeah. It's, I can't be random. No. When like, and this happens now with me with synchronicities lately. It's not one thing. It's like three or yeah. four. It'll be yeah. like boom, 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 yeah. boom, 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 yeah. boom. And I'm like, okay, yeah. this is getting ridiculous, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's I so don't know, cool, man. I, did you see from the gig the other night, O'Teal, that I sent you on the 1111? I, I, it was a little clip. If you didn't see it, I can I, I didn't can watch get a chance to watch it yet because yeah. I've been so crazy. Yeah, yeah, like no worries, man. Pinball no here, but we talked yeah. about it though you told me about yeah, the whole, yeah yeah like sequence of events and how it yeah. just like two it was like three or four things just right boom boom yeah. boom. well it gets it gets even better now i have my colonel bruce story as a result of it. so long story short my my dear friend um his daughter passed away she was 19 their lucky number was 11 11 he got an 11 11 tattoo right here and at the show we were doing uh which was the first gig i've done with this new band that i put together um i dedicated the song and the show to her and you know there's like a big digital clock staring at you to let you know when you have to get off stage um i didn't even notice that clock once that night and there were a bunch of dudes there but there were there were three women in the audience just three uh -huh. so i tell the story before i start the song i said 11 11 and, and as i'm playing the song it's 11 11 the same digital 11 11 that my buddy got red red digital oh yeah right what so yeah so i'm looking at this and i stop the song and i say hey guys in the mystical department um in the mystical department aaron aaron rose's song number with her dad was 11 11 i tell the story and it was just 11 11 and you hear immediately one of the three women say 11 11 is my birthday and the other one was the most beautiful like latin american woman dressed to the nine she goes i have 11 11 tattooed on my neck and she pulls up her ponytail and turns around and there's 11 11 across her neck and you could feel a warmth it was like 
black Southern Baptist church at his best. It was like you could feel this warmth. Damn, dude. It was incredible. So, <laughs> boom, boom, boom. so let me just bring this cup this cup into focus here. Oh, <laughs> okay. Universal okay, peace so, or A511 BNA. Oh, so, shit, dude. That's hold the on, code. Ready? Hold on, ready? Oh, <laughs> you're killing Good. me. Okay. These are all so Colonel doing, Bruce codes. Yeah. Wow. So, I'm, so I'm, I'm watching the podcast where you interview the guy that writes the book. Up. I even took a note. Hold on a second. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I I want one of those mugs. <laughs> done. So done. I'm I'm watching I'm 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 watching the the just to go back because I wanted to make this mug. I thought it'd be funny. I'm <laughs> listening to the podcast about that that inter or I'm listening to that podcast where they're talking about it and. Jerry Grillo on the episode on Bruce Hampton says, um, uh, when Bruce passed away, um, Joseph Patrick Moore had a gig. And after the show in Atlanta, he walks into his, his, his hotel room and it's set to 31. wink from outer space like oh yeah he used you know? to be one of my students joseph patrick Moore. that's oh, why cool. i didn't know that he called yeah. him the 11 and you know my management company my yeah. manager's company is called 11 11. you said that in the podcast too yeah. so i was like all right that's one of the you reasons know. that he's my manager like it's as many things but it was one of those signs because i had told him i was like oh you're into the numbers i was like mine's 12 yeah. 12. he was like yeah 11 11. And I was like, 11, 11 and 12, 12. I think this is a thing. That'll you work. Know? Yeah. And uh, so many things, man. Yeah. That's too much, man. Yeah. So how to yeah. tell me about the music thing? Because I, I thought if I'm yeah. not mistaken, you said I wasn't like playing in a band. Something happened. Yeah, oh, the yeah. podcast has decided, made you decide, yeah. like, screw it. So um, I, um, I, I've been playing music my entire life obsessed with music and I played saxophone as a, as a kid. That's the only thing I ever really took lessons in. I took a couple guitar lessons in the seventh grade, but I found Jimi Hendrix in the seventh grade yeah. and they was over. Mm. <laughs> I just, it was just over. And then I remember the summer before eighth grade, I'm driving in Doug Miller who ended up being the bassist in um, uh, crazy town, but we're driving in his, his uh, older sister's, mustang convertible and she's in high school and she puts on led zeppelin cashmere and i was like <laughs> i'm done yeah. i'm done right like sign me up so i've been my my experience around music is i probably knew the name of three or four chords on the guitar but i've but i'd written 40 or so songs because i just find a shape or something and i yeah. and i write the songs around things that i like right so fast forward, COVID happens, a bunch of my friends that are very, very like, you know, former touring musicians, and they just had a Thursday night jam and they invited me over to it. And I didn't have an electric guitar. I didn't know how to jam with others. I, I didn't really have a sense of rhythm because all my rhythm was made myself. And so I started watching this show to sort of learn about music, thinking I was going to be learning about music. <laughs> and then I started watching Tom Bukovic's homeschooling. And what's interesting is like, you know, at my company now, there are people who like graduate from Harvard Business School and Stanford Business School and they come to us and they don't have a clue. You got to teach them on the job, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have to teach them what you don't learn at business school. And so what was interesting is like the technical stuff that I need to learn, that's on YouTube. That's in a book. You guys taught me the stuff you don't learn in the book how to approach things, how to think about things, the hang, like there's so much stuff. And so two things are happening. One, I'm playing more and more with this group. And two, you guys have Victor Wooten on. And I didn't know who Victor Wooten was. I'd never heard any of his music, but I fell in love with him as a human being on your show. Yeah. And it it's was not the hard only to podcast. Do, huh? <laughs> nope. It's the only podcast that I've ever watched where a second it was done, I started over again. And my, my, my routine with you guys is Saturday morning coffee, and comes a time and you guys are my buddies Saturday morning before my family gets up. <laughs> so that podcast is over. I listen to it again. And then I buy 
the music lesson or the spirit of music. I can't remember which yeah, one's first. The music lesson. And I, I listened to it that day. Mm. Yep. <laughs> and then I listened to his next book. And what's interesting is in those books, he really just teaches you how to make music, right? Like just just play music, just dynamics and all this stuff. So um one of the nights, uh, one of the guys that was playing with us is a friend of mine, Evan Brow, who who was um, used to be the lead singer, songwriter for a band called Monka Funk. And he's now the lead singer of a band called Outer Reef that is one of my favorite bands. I, I love them. Um, and he said to me, he's like, hey, man, you ever written any songs? I'm like, yeah. He goes, well, why don't we play it? And I go, well, who's going to sing? He's like, you're going to sing. I'm, I said, I don't sing. He goes, well, you're going to sing tonight. And we <laughs> wow. played one of my songs. And dude, all I can say is that it was, it was like better than it was, I don't want to say it was better to watch, to listen to this song that I've been writing, playing alone to walls, to nature for 20 years Yeah, where there's drums and bass and other guitar players. And it was the most, <laughs> one of the most magical moments of my life. And fast forward two, three months later, um, Joel Bunn, who is, um, uh, is the bassist in, in that band plays in another band and said, Hey, one of my other bands um, was asked to play in a, in a, in a festival and we can't play it. So we're going to play. And I go, well, who? He goes, us. <laughs> I go, what songs? He's like, your songs. We know 10 of your songs. <laughs> and I go, who's singing? He's like, you're singing. <laughs> so man, I looked through the archives of Teal and Mike. I looked through the archives, but so number one, when I played football, if we had a game on Sunday or Saturday, I was nervous three or four days before. Oh, and I mean, yeah. n dead nervous. I got you. <laughs> the two, three weeks leading or whatever, the two weeks, well, one week, it was a week. We had a week. The one week leading up to this. And by the way, we didn't have a bassist yet either, bass player, because Joel in our bun plays guitar. Uh -huh. So we had two practices with Tony Hawking, who's our bassist, bass player. What do you say, bassist or bass player? Either one. Okay, so there's not like a rookie term. <laughs> Basis, Either work. I think it's cor correct, okay. whatever the hell that okay. is. <laughs> okay. So uh, interestingly enough, I, I've learned, I've become a hypnotist in these past few years so I can hypnotize myself. And I hypnotize myself not to be nervous. Mm. Oh, please teach me that shit. Yeah, well, can we? Yeah, I, I can. Sign yeah, me up for I that can, class. I can. Please. I can. <laughs> But what's interesting is on the, so I wasn't nervous all week and actually it wasn't the hypnosis that did it. And I'll tell you, I'll share this in a second because this is really important. Um, as I'm driving over to the gig, you guys had a, a jazz blues player and I tried to look him up. I couldn't find him, but his message around getting, you guys talked about getting nervous. He's like, man, I see getting nervous as a privilege. Like I'm honored to get to be doing something that makes me nervous. I think it was so, Ivan Neville when he got straight from doing heroin or whatever and he was like now i gotta been. deal with the nerves yeah he was like hey this been. is what it's like you know yeah. to yeah. embrace it yeah i wow. think it was so on the drive over i started getting nerves <laughs> and i had just that morning listened to your guys's podcast and he was on talking about the gratitude around it so as i'm driving over there feeling the nerves i just go hey be grateful like yeah it wasn't since football that you had you, you know there, yeah. there, or how many times since football have you been nervous about doing something because you care about it so much? So um, wow. I actually think, though, wow. so as a young man, as a young man, my ego was leading this, the charge and it wasn't Rolexes and fancy cars. I've never been that guy. It was just save, just protect Andrew. Like the ego was there to save my life. Yeah. So it was in the it was in the driver's seat through the work that I did through COVID and all the other stuff that I did. I genuinely feel like the ego, um, I, I can see him, I know who he is, but the human part of me has taken over and it's not the ego leading the, the drive. So I actually think I wasn't nervous because my ego wasn't scared about failing. Mm -hmm. I was just really excited to make music. I'd been, it'd been a lifelong dream yeah. as much as football, as much as joining the Navy. It was like one of three lifelong dreams to play music. And I can't tell you any football games I'd be flying to with my headphones on listening to music pretending i was the one making it and now yeah, i'm making it so yeah you know so, what's funny every, every yeah, so night now, in the hotel before doing stand-up i'm doing that too bro i'm listening amazing, to band right? of gypsies and i'm like that's me at the fillmore east yeah, lane who right. knows you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know we so had cool. amy cuddy on one time and she was so great and she comes to 
a bunch of the dead and company shows and her and my wife became friends. And so we text. Yeah. And so we were about to do something, go on, play somewhere. And she, and she just texts me because she knows I get nervous before I go on. She yeah. goes, you're not nervous. You're excited. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> I wish my hands weren't cold and Dude. clammy, but yeah. she just solved it for me because like, it's, I still care. Yeah. yeah. You still care. You know, you still the- care. And go ahead. Sorry, Mike. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm thinking about something and I don't want to. I was just, I was just going to say too, like another part of the magic of this show. um, There'll be some haters out there who are in the comments right now. Like, Oh, Andrew's kissing their ass. This is all just true. (laughs) Right. This is all just true. I have a million ways. My job is getting in touch with people. I have a million ways I could have reached out to you guys. I have a million ways I could have reached out to Victor. I was so moved by Victor that I sent him on his fan email a three sentence email that told him how I felt about his books and him as a human. And fast forward, we are now really good friends. Nice. And, and that's good. another result of this. It wasn't me searching him out. It was Danette, his manager found that email and goes, you get it. Yeah. Vic's going to be in LA in a couple of weeks. You're going to host him for two days. That's the kind of trust that she had to me in one email. And she said she gets thousands of emails every day. But my oh, point in saying that, sure is I've got to pick Victor Wooten's brain. And Victor Wooten said, there is O'Teal and there's every, and then there's every, and the next best <laughs> bass players. He, he just said, look, he's the best. He's, he's got more capabilities than anybody else. Wow. And, um, you know, but, and I said to him, but he doesn't show off. He's like, yeah, he's not a show off. Right. So there's a lot of ways. I disguise it well. I I mean, I've seen you solo and stuff, but it doesn't feel to me like you're trying to, you know, you're trying to listen. I'm not showing off when I'm soloing. That's when I'm terrified because that's the, got it. That's the part where, and that's just the old Colonel Bruce thing where you have to push yourself off the cliff because I hate my voice for one thing. But other times that I'm playing, I am showing off when I'm like, you know, yeah. But I hear what you're saying. You're in not the, a show off. Show. <laughs> you're not a show off. When it's time for you to do your job and deliver solo, you're doing, you're not a show off. There's some people that are show offs and you're not a show off, right? Yeah. I'm but, not, cause, cause I don't know what I'm going to do. So that's why I can't show off because oh, it might interesting. totally fail. Cause I yeah. have zero idea. Wow. I've often opened my mouth and put my hand to the fretboard and it just went left and, and I'll sit there and I'm like looking at it. I'm watching it. <laughs> just like people in the audience, but it can become a reflex. That's the Colonel Bruce training, yeah. which I want to say to people. Interesting. A lot of Vic's book, uh, his book, um, the music lesson and spirit of music. A lot of it is the things that Bruce was teaching me. In fact, Colonel Bruce is in, I was like, who wow. is this guy? Oh, interesting. And, and Vic goes, it's an amalgamation of people. He goes, part of oh, it is Colonel interesting. Bruce. And he said, yeah. part of it is you. Do you remember? When, and I was like, I don't remember what part. He's like, come on, Teal, you've read it. You were the one that said this to me. And then he told me, I was like, I can't remember the cannabis. Wow. Too, what was it? What was it? He what said, was it when you, you said, asked you your bass, he said, I hugged my bass. And when, when he told, when he reminded yeah. me, I was like, I do remember that. Because yeah. my basses are so heavy. And there was a point where this bass, that first five string, I mean, the first six string that I took to Reggie Wooten's house and asked him to show me chord melody and unlock the secrets of heaven, you know? Yeah. And I would sleep with it because I would wake up like, oh, oh blah, blah, blah. And one day wow. I had been through a lot with this bass. And I said, man, you have, you and me have been on this journey. Like, thank you. You know, I just was holding it and I thanked it. And then when I went to pick it up, I swear to God, it felt two or three times lighter. Hmm. It was like, yeah, and in the book, it jumps into his hand, right? I totally remember that part of the book. Yeah, it's like something happened. Yeah, because of that part of the book, I kiss this guitar all the time. No, I get it. Really? See, that's 100%. That's beautiful. And I don't even remember that. But it just, this is a a theme that I'm constantly coming back to where our intent, intention, which is Bruce's 100% of his thing, intention. It can affect physical, it can affect this. Mm. Like if yeah. Yeah. I believed I could make it disappear and appear in your hand or on your desk right now, on camera, right? Yeah. 
but because I don't really believe I can do it yet, I can't. But yeah. when I put that intention, when I gave that to the base, it just, it gave it back. It made it. Yeah. I don't think I got stronger. Something magical. I don't know. And maybe it wasn't real. Maybe it was all in my head. Well, but maybe it was, <laughs> maybe it was like one plus one equals 10. And that's what I think you know, it was. Right. And maybe these are aliens. They're alive. Right? Everything and, vibrates. Right? It's just they're vibrating slower. Right. A mm -hmm. rock is right. still alive. It's just vibrating slower. Right. So I, I tend to think maybe the faster vibration is actually the faster you vibrate, then you become non-physical. Yeah. Hmm. Now, we're, we're, are we just light and pure intention and consciousness yeah. not slowed down into the, I, I don't know, but you know, yeah. all I know is it was something and he spells it out so good in that book. It's so, so beautiful. Many different things that Bruce yeah. taught me. Oh, and there's another so book beautiful. that I want to turn people onto. And it's by Kenny Werner called Effortless Mastery. Mm. My drummer, uh, Chris Fryer, who plays with Zach Brown Band, he, when we were in the Peacemakers together, um, he brought this book on the road and he was like, dude, this is like so profound. And he got to the point where he was just like reading it reading it to us in the bus. And I was like, dude, that's exactly what, you know, that's what Colonel Bruce meant by Platorn. Yeah. That's what Colonel Bruce meant by Brayto Ganib or whatever, you know? And I realized that, that these other Colonel Bruce's out there and they're all teaching this thing in different ways. Yeah. But that those, if you didn't have the, cause Bruce never wrote a book. I just got the opportunity to, to, live with him you know it's so amazing for years but yeah vic's book and that book effortless mastery i think really can help i'll check that out yeah all play music i encourage everybody if in your 50s start in your yeah. 50s start playing piano whenever Just do it for fun now you're yep. at festivals it's crazy <laughs> I mean, we're being so cool by the way danette danette asked us to open for vic the other night <laughs> how it. cool <laughs> But what you know better who my, testament to the music lesson and to the spirit of music totally. than that? Right. Totally. Exactly. Yeah. And Reggie, I've taken a couple lessons with Reggie now. I mean, it's just, I'm like Dude. part of their family. It's such, it's so crazy and so natural. Like Talk about uh, angels, so, bro. Angels. Talk well, about angels. Uh, yeah. I could, I want to go back to your, I think there's a, a nugget that I can deliver potentially to the audience, but I I will say that my experience around meeting Vic is one of the most mystical experiences. I have it journaled. I'm actually happy to publish it. And when I met him, it went from an email to you're picking him up at the airport and he's going to spend two days with you. There was no <laughs> calls with Vic. There was no nothing. There was just a Hyper trust space. there. Yeah. I can't explain to you how many mystical things happened. So when he, and I've, I've already told you about one or two of them, but he gets in the car at the airport and I'm driving with him and he's got his bases with him. We're just kind of catching up and chatting and he's, you know, how low key he is. I said, Hey man, I don't want to spook you out, but you know, all this stuff happened between the, the email and right now. He's like, he's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> he goes in my family. That's the way things work. Yeah. And I know what happened and I, and, and you know, you either believe that it happened or it didn't. And that was all he needed to say. Mm. And then binary, we had two man. beautiful, we had two beautiful days together. I, um, I, I brought him to friends. We had like podcasts without podcasts. I had to meet different friends. We had some beautiful meals. I'm part of um, a community here called Oak Park and Treehouse that's all about health and wellness. And, and uh, there, there's a men's group in there where he came and we sauna and like did the ice buckets. I mean, he's training with like world-class athletes <laughs> And just write in meditation and breath Dude, work and extremists. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And, and I'll say this, <laughs> I'm really glad. So the first time I ever heard Vic's music or saw him play was, was at that week when he played and it was wow. at this amazing small venue. And I just, after the show, he goes, what'd you think? I go, I'm just glad I met you after, I mean, before I heard your music, because this might've gotten in the way of our friendship. I, I was uh, so mesmerized. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, Jimmy, Jimi Hendrix is my guy, right? Like yeah. he's my favorite. Number one, he's my favorite. And I remember not thinking this, but all of a sudden going like, this is how some people felt when they saw Jimi Hendrix at live because he was Absolutely. doing things with his bass. You've seen and then the Marcus impossible. Miller got up there with him. Yeah. yeah. Impossible. You see the impossible. Yeah. Impossible. So that's all I yeah. look for, you know, and this is why, uh, 
this is what this is Colonel Bruce 101. It's uh Sun Ra 101. It's every every deep cat in every area of life 101 is the impossible. Right? It could be Martin Luther King. Yeah. Do you know what I it could be Harriet Tubman. Yeah. It could be whatever. Yep. That's what my eye is open for. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. And it's it's not subtle. It's kind of sticks out, you yeah. know. If you happen to walk around the corner and Victor Wooten's in the full throes of Victor Wootening, you're gonna be like, yeah. What? What is yeah. that? Does somebody dose me? It's what's yep. going on right now. Right? It's exactly it, it, like seeing Hendrix. Yeah. You're just like it, your brain can't even compute it. You're like, nope. uh, you know. It, yeah. There was I'm sure there was a point where he just totally untuned his base kept <laughs> one and then it was almost and i and marie who we meet was a me um who's a shaman from africa and she's a rhythm she plays a djembe and a bunch of my music friends were with me there was a moment where it was almost like there was a cyclone at our table when he was doing his thing and all of us just kind of looked at each other like like did that happen did yeah. that and marie was so affected by it she just went into this prayer yeah and held the prayer the entire thing and i mean it was Dude, it was what he was talking about in the music lesson right i mean he did <laughs> he did and it. i don't know if it's a magic trick i don't know what it is but it was well, real you know it is it's and i realized this this morning we have this whole like scientific materialism that's the thing that's really recent and what they've done is redefined what magic is but think about in the old days, what was a wizard? What was he doing? He was sitting in there yeah. working with formulas. Right. <laughs> yeah. There's a certain order. There's an ingredient list. This has to go right. in this and it has to be at this. These are formulas. Yeah. They were the scientists. You know what I mean? They're doing. And yeah. so magic is a science. Right. So that's why, because, you know, I am using things that I cannot prove exist to tap into what I use to do my magic. But I know if I do this, I can get through the portal and right. these things are way more likely to happen and it'll freak me and who I'm doing it with out as much as everybody in the audience. That's the grateful dead. Yeah. Right. How, what's the, <laughs> so, so if you know the formula and you execute the formula, how often does it produce magic? With the right people every freaking time. Like me and wow. Kofi, my brother yeah. Kofi, God rest yeah. his soul. We would not play together for years. Or maybe I hadn't played with him in a year. Mm -hmm. And we get together and boom, we're like this. And where oh. we would really know like the thing that yeah. would make me and Kofi laugh. Because we're kind of used to it, like being brothers, you know it's going to happen. Yeah, but we would go off the rails at the same time. Wow, we would be so linked that if I messed up, it threw him off too, or vice versa. And I didn't know whether it was him messing up that made me go off, or me first, or maybe we yeah. both just went off the tracks. But when when you're that linked, and we would laugh, we'd be like, okay, that, that's yeah. being linked, right? So, but yeah, you have to, and with the wrong people, it will prevent it from happening. Interesting. The wrong drummer and yeah, yeah. I'm like it, literally like Superman with if you put kryptonite, just lay a little piece of kryptonite on and I'm powerless. Yeah. Mm. So, so there's it's amazing like isn't it? protocols. It, Remember the Stefan A. Schwartz podcast where he talked about religions uh, being a series of protocols, and if you get everybody together with the same intention, there's a music, there's meditation slash prayer. This you put all these things together. Like you said, it's what happened with Victor at the table and everybody at the yeah. table can, it can even affect physical things. You could have a little yeah. cyclone real. thing happen yeah. on top of the table. Like it, it's yeah. real, I, but yeah. I don't know, like I can't prove it, but who could, what scientists can prove? Right. You can't measure well, what, the thing that's doing the measuring, your consciousness. Yeah, right. Well, and uh, two, two, th two questions. So one, let's say you have that drummer who just the chemistry is off but he knows the formula is it more about the chemistry or is it about knowing the formula or is it you, if, do you need both if it's off then 
he doesn't know the formula. Okay. In a way, which because part of the okay. formula is being is you being able to let go. So you know, there's like a with rhythm, like a groove, because Victor Wooten talks about this a lot of how to get into the groove. So yeah. there's a part of it where you have to let go to do it. So if the person's not able to let go, then they don't know the formula yeah. because part number, the big biggest part of the formula is the letting go part. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So you have to let I, it take you, you know? Yeah. I, I, this isn't what I was going to say. And by the way, I want to get back to the, um, the nervousness, please. But, um, so I grew up at Grateful Dead fan. My, my uncle, his name is Casey Jones. He was a, um, <laughs> I have two uncles, Peter Jones and right. Casey Jones from Northern California. They were, they were both roadies for Santana. And I grew Casey up, Jones Grateful Dead right. is like, it's like tribal, it's religion. I've always yeah. loved the Grateful Dead. My, my football teammates will tell you they've heard the song Althea at least a trillion times. <laughs> I, I played it five times a day, every day. But anyways, so I followed the Dead for a long time. And a couple of years ago, I think it was right pre-pandemic, Dead & Co. was at the Hollywood Bowl. And I heard a whole different John Mayer. And yeah. I called up. Um, Greg Cease, who's a longtime friend of mine from Activist, who's John, who's Dead & Co's manager, or, you know, part of the management group. And he, and he, and he said, what'd you think of last night? Because he got me the ticket tonight, and I think he was there that night. And I said, it was the best I've ever heard John. And by the way, I love John. I, I saw him when he was probably like 18 years old play, and I've been a fan yeah. of his ever, ever since. My daughter's middle name, my youngest daughter's middle name is Victoria. Because that was my song with my wife when we were dating. It's one wow. of John Mayer's songs of his first album. So I'm a big fan, but wow. I'd never seen him play loose. And I, by the way, I say yeah. this with yeah. all the humility in no, the world. No, I know. He, he got in that band for a reason. <laughs> yeah, all, I'm saying it with all the humility. But I'm, this is my interpretation as a guy who plays music. And also, what do I do as a football player? We watch game film. <clears throat> I, yeah. I don't learn about it in the game. I learn about it when I watch the film 65 times afterwards. And the same with when I'm playing music now. I just confined but i i was there that night and and so greg goes what do you think i go it's the best john's ever played it's the best i've ever heard the band played and i'm pretty sure it's the best concert i've ever been to in my life <laughs> and and i go i go what do you think he goes well we had a band meeting afterwards it was the first john's ever really let go like and he said that and john's talked about this so i'm not like breaking any confidence yeah he goes he, he goes they all agree it was the best he's played it's the best show they've ever played. But a lot of that was just about John. You know, if you're free to talk about it. I mean, I was there and witnessed that where I, he's still, an, I love him. He's an amazing guitar player. It was the first time I ever saw him just let the music come through him. It felt like he was channeling Jerry for the first time, as opposed to just hitting every yeah. note perfectly. Well, I, we all have it in us. So when, when I say like, if the, if the drummer can't do it yet, then he can't do it. I should say he can't do it yet because I was in the same spot when I met Colonel Bruce. And so that's what, that's what teachers are for, a good mentor, or a good, even a situation can mentor you like John being in Dead & Company. Mm. You know, he had never done hallucinogenics before and I didn't talk about it when he first did it because it was a big deal to his people right. that we not talk about it, right? But I remember saying to him like, you know, you are in Jerry Garcia's spot. The universe, I don't know, might want you to just at least microdose. You know, like I didn't like to play on it, but I did it on purpose because I was like, because you're in this spot. Like, you right. guys, like required reading, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do it every night. You don't have to do it all yeah. the time. You could do it once and never do it again, but you something's telling me go through the <laughs> door crazy, at least once. you know yeah, yeah. 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 So, <laughs> he got to a point where and this is where i say the band the situation ended up being his mentor because he was always in control of everything and now your partners with bob weir bill kreutzman and mickey hart <laughs> Well, a lot of control there. Crazy, <laughs> yeah. So you have to let go. Yeah. yeah, right. And then that's off stage, you know, in the partnership, but on stage, and so it's a process. And 
you know, he's a great improviser. So it's not like yeah. it's foreign to him. But now you're in like where we may not have any key tuning. Yeah. Yeah. Tempo rhythm. Yeah. We might just be in outer space. You know, yeah. so and, and a lot of that is like where Colonel Bruce would teach us like how to reframe how we're looking at it, which reframes your intention. Now, if your intention yeah. is to throw yourself off the cliff and you're like, now you're willing. Yeah. And you just got to flap, start right. flapping like when the bird gets yeah. thrown out of the nest. And uh, so I think it was definitely a process with him. And it kind of culminated in the last tour. It like all of a sudden, you know, yeah. it was like, damn, the band's breaking up now when it, we just finally yeah. <laughs> unlocked the uh, whole thing. Was... You know? <laughs> But it's kind I, of, I mean, you know, it's yeah, funny. <laughs> I even the, so the tour before the last one, you guys were achieving such high art that it was like, I think you said, well, we got to do this again. But the, <laughs> the places you guys went on that last tour, Mike, can you back me? I mean, that's the best I'd ever heard. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah, like, it was it the, was. Yeah. I mean, it, I think it's kind of like been. Yeah, yeah. Like everybody. Yeah. Everyone agrees. Yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was, it was bananas. That's why I say it's like, you can't yeah. prove it. We can't prove or scientifically measure it, but everybody knows, including mm, yeah. John, everybody mm. was like, wow. So yeah. we're never going to do this again. Right. Like that's. And then the sphere. Opens. Well, probably well, now not you the are. Right move. Yeah. 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 yeah, you are. And you know, by man, way, so yeah, go ahead. Sorry. There's just one thing I wanted to add to that. Like, you know, what if you have somebody who's like, maybe not in that hypothetical, what if the drummer's not, feeling it kind of thing i think sometimes too there's a group for every <clears throat> my dad used to say a silly thing that like there's an ass for every seat <laughs> but it's kind of like maybe that drummer in that hypothetical situation that we were talking about maybe that's not the right group of people for him you know yes, everybody's yeah. got their place to kind of shine maybe that world they're in or whatever the team they're on or that it's just not the right fit and sometimes yeah. it takes a couple wrong fits to find the right fit. And that's something I think yeah. that's pretty yeah. important too, because, you know. Yeah, totally, man. Totally. Great point. Sometimes it just takes some yeah. life to pass. Like I, yeah. I find myself hearing people, especially when they're younger and I can't hold it against them, you know, yeah. but I'm like, people try so hard really to gifted fit in. And yeah. They're yeah. really, you could tell they've put yeah. a lot of time into their instrument and they will hold my interest after their mom dies. Mm, I, yeah, it came right. to me uh, recently. I was like, you know what? I want blood. I need blood because once yeah. Colonel Bruce showed me, once you hear a howling wolf in his prime, when you hear a John yep. Lee Hooker, when you hear uh, Mavis Staples, yeah. When you hear Mahalia Jackson, when you hear people that went through some shit. Yeah, man, totally. Like you don't play the same. Yeah. Right. No. After no. you've been through that well, stuff. It's same with yeah. comedy, same with anything. Yeah, totally. After you've experienced yeah. some stuff. I'm totally. not taking anything from their talent. But now I need yeah. blood. I'm like, well, it's not bleeding yet. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. to that point, so here so I said earlier, like, I learned so much from you guys. This is the stuff. They don't teach you in the music book. Now, Vic tries to. Yeah. But one of the things that I learned from you, so I have a week to play in this first gig. And by the way, when I talk about the music, again, with all the humility in the world, but this was my experience around preparing myself to be able to play live in front of people as someone who's never had been singing for three months, right? So I'm a lead singer. But what's interesting is um, what I picked up from you guys, from Vic, from Tom Bukovec is it's a conveyance of emotion. Yeah. And every song that I'm playing, I wrote, and they are about my life and my life is on display for you. Right. So I'm not nearly as good technically as some people are, but when I'm making this music, I'm being honest and trying to convey the love, the pain, the whatever it is. Right. And that's one of those things where, you know, it's probably the most important lesson I learned in music because if you're not doing that and, and you don't have a story that you can connect to, then you're, then you might just be a technically proficient artist that isn't connecting with anybody. But that's what you know, I one was. of the things, 
that's what Got it. it was when Colonel yeah. Bruce, when I met the Colonel, he's like, nobody gives a shit, including me. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to hear you play what you practice, man. Right. Right. And meanwhile, <laughs> you had, you'd had enough life there too, to, to, yeah, right, he's to like, didn't your dog die? And, to... didn't yeah. you got... and I had got my heart broken. I had <laughs> all kinds of stuff that I yeah. wasn't accessing. Yeah. That I was trying to practice out of my playing, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Without you know, realizing it. Yeah. Amazing. You know, I was like shining yeah. up all the scars yeah. and bleeding. I like, go oh, clean up that blood and, you know, put some makeup over that scar. He's like, no, that's where the whole thing is. So yeah. then you get to a point where you're like really good at your instrument. And all these guys that literally by your standards can't play that yeah. are making millions of dollars. And so then Colonel Bruce challenged me. He goes, well, why are they connecting with people and you're not? And that's when I realized it ain't about that. Yeah, you yeah. can't stand to listen to Mick Jagger or Bob Dylan sing. Why are they connecting with everybody? It's exactly what Vic not. said. Yep, 100%. Right? 100%. And now I was like, okay, so how do I connect with people? He's like, you've got to connect with yourself. You're, you're cleaning up everything. Yeah. You need to embrace that, that our second album is called the mirrors of embarrassment. He's like, we need all that, all of wow. that, all your Amazing. little big, we're going to put yeah. high def spotlight, electron yeah. microscope. Right. And so I was like, man, I don't know if I could do that, <laughs> but see you, you're like these songs, like look at Lemmy from motorhead. Now right. you have Lemmy, you have Jaco Pastorius. I'm like, that guy can't play. I have no time. Now I get Lemmy. Yeah. Lemmy told his story and it hit with so many people. Sure. Yeah. And you could go sit at a bar in LA and talk to Lemmy till the cows come home. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He's it's a very amazing. approachable. Like he's just like this. That's right? cool. And I have a lot of, now I can appreciate him and all these other musicians. Grateful yeah. Dead. I was, I didn't get it. Yeah. Now I'm like, oh, duh. Yeah, Duh, it was right there the whole time. So I fully support your songs. Yeah, hit. that's blood. I think about the songs that it's I blood, wrote. Man. Through, that's yeah, blood. man. That's yeah, it's blood. Yeah. It really is. It bleeds. And, it's, and the new ones are inspired by various things, you know. Um, Otil, so like, so if I'm hearing you, um, the two things that are important for you are honesty and putting yourself in a position to achieve magic. Like if you're and on stage, putting yourself in a position to embarrass yourself because it has to be naked. This is what Colonel Bruce said. Like you have to strip everything off because okay. that's the only way we're going to see. I want to see and hear and feel everything you're trying to hide. Okay. So, so now all these things I'm trying to hide, I'm going to use yep. as fuel mm -hmm. for the music. You got there without all that you went straight to it because that's all you had you had this intention this story this pain and you spilled it out it's so hard for people to do that that have these gifts of being yeah. you know hand eye or yeah, whatever totally blah 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 bruce is like i'm so bored with that shit man i don't yeah. know if, I, if there's not blood with it forget yeah well i'd like to i'd like to so <clears throat> Quick story, when I was a sophomore in college, I was starting on the, on, on the, you know, starting. And I would either score like a 96 or a 60. And our, our sport, my position is very binary. You either did your job or you didn't. So it's very easy to grade. And the coaches, Damon Baldwin, another angel in my life, realized if you can score in the 90s, you should never be in the 60s. So he found that I had a mental block. And what would happen... To Mike, to our point earlier about doing this, if I blew one play, it would affect me. I'd be so upset by it that I'd blow the next seven, right? Yeah. You're thinking about in the last plays. <laughs> yeah. And it just, and so if I could play a game where I didn't blow any plays, I could score 96. But if I blew one play, I was going to score 60. So after my sophomore year, um, I'd broken my leg and, and uh, with two games left. So he, you know, I, I healing my foot up, healing, healing my leg up, excuse me, and started meditating. And I meditated every morning and every night without missing a session. And what I would do is I would visualize everything going up. And so I get myself in a meditative state. I'm happy to do this with you guys together separately. But 
you know, visualize myself, get, I'd get into a meditative state, get to my little island, and then I would play a game. I'd play my first quarter and I would visualize messing up. Mm. And my mantra oh. when I messed up was play is over, forget it, focus. And I'd clap, focus. And it would give uh. me strength. So when I would blow my first play, I'd be like, yes, I blew it. Plays over, forget it, focus. That's done. That's and so what I never said. scored. Yeah. And so here's what I would, here's what I'd say for you, man. Um, and so when I went into that first gig and every gig now, my mantra now is I'm going to have fun and I'm going to crush it. That's I'm it. I'm going to have fun and I'm going to crush it. So every, so, but with you, maybe every time like you're thinking about a gig or every time you get nervous, you reframe it. So this is the hypnosis and all hypnosis is, is having like a mantra and consistently doing it. And then it becomes real. Right. Yes. So if when you, if you get a little nervous, you take a second and breathe. I'm going to be naked. Right. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to put myself into me, make magic. And I'm going to be honest with my bandmates and those that are watching us. And that becomes the frame. And if yeah. in the beginning, you might do it 50 times a day, but if that becomes a frame sooner, soon the, the nervousness will go down mm. and then that's the intention will go up. Yes. Right. And, Yes. And I say this as somebody is, who studied this. Go yeah. ahead. Sorry. No, I was just saying the intention is bigger than a fleeting moment of failure. Bingo. Yeah. Bingo. Bruce, Bruce would always love bad nights. He would celebrate it. We'd have just an off night. Be like, no yeah. matter how hard you try, you know, not just uh, me, it would be the whole band. We just like yeah. had a bad night and he yeah. would just celebrate. And I was like, why are you so happy? Cause he goes, cause now it's over with. What are the yeah. odds of us having right. multiple bad nights in a row? And I thought, oh, yeah, yeah you're right. It's a, so now if we could do that micro, right? Yeah. Oh, you blew a plate. It's over. Yeah. It's over. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. And wow. it's amazing, man. Like I, you know, manifestation is like a big theme in my life. And I've got some stories of, I mean, this right now, I could have called Greg and said, hey, I, I, I don't go on podcasts. Yeah. Right. I didn't try to meet Victor, um, but I knew I was going to be on this podcast. I said, when the time's right, <laughs> when the, I'll be on the, I'll get a call. And, you know, lo and behold, like Donette, Danette called me and said, you should meet Oteal and go on his podcast. I'm like, yeah, I should. Right. So, <laughs> but if you're intentional about that Oteal and like when you meditate at night, you know, visualize that um, as somebody who's trained in this for 20 years, like it's almost like karma. Like if you're nice to everybody, chances are people are gonna be nice back to you right if you're mean to everybody yeah. you're probably gonna get in a couple of fist fights yeah if you're intentional that much around it i'll i almost guarantee you i will guarantee you that your nervousness will go down because you're replacing it with those intentions just make them short enough to where you can do them in a blink of an eye plays yeah. over forget it focus well i'm and usually then, good in the yeah. moment like once we start playing sure it's like the two hours before we play yeah it's that's so how it works ag my stomach is just yeah. like and but once we get going, it's like the magic, once the magic starts yeah. flowing, then we're all surfing totally. together. But yep. I think what you said earlier about, I get nervous because I care. I honestly think that one thought seed might've just cured it for me. Oh, cool. Because it's now I'm not, now I've reframed what it is. Yeah. It's like what Amy Cuddy said, she goes, you're not nervous. You're excited. Yeah. And I was like, well, now I go, you're not nervous you still care a lot just as yeah. much as when you first started. Right. How but cool you can care. It's amazing. It's a gift. It's such yes. a gift. You know how many people are like burnt out? Can't, do you know how hard like it is for some people to get to work? I mean, you care, but caring doesn't mean you have to be nervous. Caring means yes. you're yes. naked, right? You're, and, and if you're naked, you're going to mess up. So celebrate them. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just a reframe. Of course you're nervous. You're about to go yeah. play in front of 50,000 people. Yeah. yeah. Duh, you're nervous. Like, yeah. you know? yeah. or even if it's like, even if it's 50, like when I could see yeah. the whites of everybody, then I'm even yeah. more like, uh, but it's like, yeah, yeah I, I love that. Uh, just being able to reframe it and not to say yeah. that I'm not going to try the meditation also, because yeah, it's agonizing. It's just like the, uh, yeah. but I'm going to reframe yeah. it. I'm not, it's not agonizing. Yeah. I just care that much. <laughs> yeah. Amazing, man. By the way, I know you guys have a, how are you on time? Cause I want to, I want to touch on two things. 
Um, Are you, you guys have the time left? Got, we need to bolt. What t- uh, what's two hour? We're pushing. We started at eleven. We're at one. I have yeah. a one thirty thing I need to do. Okay, cool. Um, well, I, I was. You, I'll, I'll just these. These are uh, you. Have, you have two minutes. If you could do it quick, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll just I'll have to pee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I can oh, hold on a few yeah. more minutes. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so there's a lot here that I. I brought to know. Well, I mean, dude, first of all, but... first of all, we're having you back. I mean, you oh, got to cool. come yeah. back for a third and fourth. <laughs> yeah. So don't, no pressure, but okay. please go ahead and, and yeah, we like, can edit this down yeah. too. Yeah. 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 Oh, well, cool. well, well, this is going to be at least two episodes. So three things rapid fire. The first is a little selfish, but my, I, I'm in a band called Owl. I love my guys. That's the band that like Owl? Me, Owl, O W L. I knew you were going to and... love that, Mike. <laughs> Yeah. you know my happen. love affair with those animals do you know anything about <laughs> my whole no. thing dude. oh shit dude yeah we'll talk about that another time okay cool give me your address <laughs> text me have eric text me your address right on yeah i'll send okay. yeah yeah so but the other thing is i've got this new side project and the reason i even bring up the band or anything is is um we've been trying to come up with a name and the guys i told the guys that i was doing this podcast and like i'll tell you what let us know the name on the podcast like announce the name. So the new, the name of the band is Lyda L Y D A Gans, and that was my great grandmother, Lyda Gans. Just got like a Led Zeppelin feel to me, or like. Sure. A, so yeah. that's the name of the band for the guys. Um, F- so the announcement of our name. They asked me to do that. <laughs> Shout but out. The other two things. The other two things I was going to say is this, Mike. Yeah. I saw your your special. I've watched it twice now. Okay. And I got to tell you, I thought you crushed it. Thank you. I was like uh, the hemorrhoid one. <laughs> I, I was ugly crying because I could see that happening. I could just see it like I was ugly crying when it happened too. <laughs> yeah. But, but I, I got to tell you, man, like, you know, I know you as Mike on the podcast. So to see you sort of in character, like felt like it was really you. Yeah. But I could see, you know, the routine and I thought, I thought it was awesome. So I was a little nervous. I'm like, God, I hope it's almost like when you meet your, your favorite celebrity, you hope they're nice. I was like, man, I hope this, <laughs> The stand-up's good because I really like this guy. And I just oh, want to say, I just want to say, you didn't let down, man. I, I I thought it was awesome. I got through it. I was like sweating for you when I started it. I was like nervous like you were my child playing soccer. Thank you. Thank you. See, that's yeah. fine. That's that's I appreciate your uh yeah. Right. It's but like it was great. Thank you so much. It was great. I'll be yeah, in the, uh, uh I'll be in Cali soon, so come see a live show. Oh, amazing, man. Yeah. Amazing. I would love to. I'll bring some buddies. I'd love to. The, the other thing I'd say is this. is, um, So I'm not Catholic, but my good buddy, Dom Rosso, Navy SEAL, who I mentioned, is. And I was having dinner with him about two years ago. And he, he has a crucifix that, like, has gone to war with him. And he was holding on to it at our dinner. And I just was, like, looking at it. And I'm like, man, that's – and he was telling me about it. And, and um, he puts it in my hand. He goes, this is for you. This is to protect you. Like as my brother, this is for you. Wow. And it was really special. So I kept it in my pocket forever because I'm not Catholic and I've always sort of like, I know I've never worn a cross, um, kept it in my pocket forever. And, and it was, you know, like of the most important things, like my guitar, my, you know, I don't, I'm not like a physical goods guy, but that was like one of the most important things in my life. I have a friend who's a big wave surfer, had a bunch of TBIs and I, and I was hanging out with him and I, he was in a bad place. And as I, I gave him a hug goodbye, and as I'm leaving, something said to me, give him that crucifix. He needs this. Yeah. And it was like, no, I love this crucifix. And yeah. what if, you know, like, there was a second, too. It's like, well, what if he thinks that's cheesy? And I was like, something told you to give it to him, give it to him. So I gave it to him, bursts into tears. You know, I call Dom up. I tell him he sends me another one. Wow. Um, so fast forward, I'm like, all right, I'm not giving this one away, right? I'm with a friend of mine. I, so I'm a friend of mine is, is, his. he's had one son with cancer who beat it, second son with cancer who beat it. And that same son is going through cancer now a second time. Oh, and as soon as I saw him I started we- weeping and I, and he's very Catholic, I give him the cross uh-huh. and I tell him the story about my buddy Dom and the Navy SEAL. And so then, and, and it, I only have given these to people when, when it, when something tells me to do it, it's not proactive. It's not like a peace offering. It's just something yeah. says, give it to him. So fast forward, I'm blanking on his last name, but there's a music producer in LA named Theron. I don't know if you guys have played with him. He was Michael Jackson's music director, mm. but, but I was at an event where we're in a small room and he's playing and there's like, he's playing like 30 of us. Everything was improvised. 
And after that, we were all out at dinner and I was so blown away by this guy's music that I walk up to him. So anyways, I see him at the dinner and it hit me. This guy needs your cross, right? Hmm. So I walk up to him. I say, dude, dude, I was so moved by your music. Like take it off my neck, give it to him. He was, he didn't say a word to me. He, he didn't say thank you. He just was speechless. And about three hours later, he came up to me. He's like, Hey man, my dad's a Southern Baptist preacher, very religious. And a friend of mine from Brazil gave me the exact same crucifix that broke three days ago. So I can't tell you. And when I saw you, I saw the crucifix on your neck and I was noticing that that's my, that's the one I had. Right. Wow. So my, my point is, is I don't want to be like didactic and I'm not telling you what to do, but in the special, you talked about all your crucifixes, just an idea, maybe you keep one in your pocket. And when the spirit moves you, <laughs> you hand them to people because I have to tell you, you're forever bonded with them. You are forever. Yeah. You are forever. And, it, and, it, and you'll know when the person needs it. I've now given one to a random person that needed it. Yeah. Every time I've given these things out, they are a good so idea. needed. Yeah, so yeah, maybe I should carry it around. Box. Yeah, I literally box, have. <laughs> He's like, I don't know what to do with all these damn things. Yeah. I got nine yeah. Jesuses. I don't know what to do with. Yeah. Yeah. They might all belong right. to other people now, man. So, that's a, I really yeah, appreciate not to be like, that. Yeah. No, that's the coolest yeah. thing. Yeah, no, totally. I appreciate that. It's uh, it's true. Wow, that's amazing. That really is well, wild. I think the lesson is for me, because if the, boy, if there could ever be a theme of this podcast, you know. Don't ignore the voice, the, the, the urges, yep. the, yeah. Yep. yeah. I don't know how do I tell the difference when it's my head or some, something else or someone else, but you just yeah. know, yeah. You know, because it's yeah. not your thought. It hits you. It hits, it hits you. you. And so take the call, yeah. answer yeah. the door, pick up the phone, do th give the cross, give the cross, do the thing, yeah. whatever it is, please respond. And it, if I could even go further, keep your eye and ear open for that voice or that yeah. sign yeah. or the whatever. Like, I don't know how it's coming. It's come to me in voices. It's come to me in a happening. Yeah. You see something. So yeah. if your eyes are open, you're going to see the magic and then find yeah. it. And, and then the reaction of the people that you gave the cross to verifies that the right. voice was, yeah. you know, that this was all real. hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. So cool, man. For those yeah. Things, yeah. Thank man. you very Seriously, much. Yeah, man. man. That's super Absolutely. cool. And please come yeah. back again. Like this was a blast. This went by so oh, I'd quick. I'd love to. Yeah, yeah. I, feel I like would this love to. And... For me, <laughs> like I feel like this. Is a... <laughs> Thank you. You know, because we put a lot of time into doing this. Yeah. You know, and it really makes such a huge difference to have someone go, man. Let me tell you how this podcast and all what you did affected my life. So. Yeah, it yeah. means a lot. Thank well, Thanks. absolutely. And for the community, there's a lot of there's a lot of those voices through through your various guests and stuff that hopefully they hear and just like I did. And thank you from the bottom of my heart to both you guys for for doing this. You have had a profound effect on on my life and I'll forever be grateful and forever be brothers with you guys. So God thank bless you, you guys and thank, thank you for you. everything. Yeah. Thank you. Definitely. I hope I'm gonna see you in Las Vegas, dude. I'll be there, man. I'll be Come there. On, we do know we got to hook up, bro. Yeah, I'll be there yeah, for, for sure. a few, for there. sure. Yeah, okay. I'll be there soon, too. Thank you, man. Thank you so yeah. much. All right, How guys, cool. take care. Thank you so much. Cheers. We'll see you guys. See you next time. <laughs> yeah, for sure.